My name is Dr. Neelay Tucker. I'm an interventional spine physician at Orthopedic One. My background is physical medicine and rehabilitation, and I did my residency at The Ohio State University, followed by a interventional pain or interventional spine fellowship at The Ohio State University. Um, specifically, I've been at Orthopedic One for the past year, and my office is based out of Westerville and Grove City. So today we're gonna to talk about facet joint syndrome. So to understand facet joint syndrome, you first gotta know what exactly the facet joint is. So the facet joint is a small joint that connects one segment or vertebral body of the spine to another. And you actually have two at each level. So you have both a left and a right facet joint. And if you can take a look at this model here, I can kind of show you that where exactly the facet joint is at each level. So it's a small joint that's located on both the left and the right side of your spine. And that small joint is responsible for the motion of the spine. So specifically a lot of the twisting motion as well as forward bending or flexion and backward bending or extension. And it's often a condition that's tied closely together with degenerative disc disease or um, age-related degeneration of the discs. And the reason being is when you have more degeneration of the discs, that in turn puts more stress on the facet joint themselves. Um, it's also thought to be the primary cause of chronic low back pain in up to 25 to 30% of people. Um, and it's often a very common cause of neck and low back pain that I see in my office, so cervical and lumbar pain. And rarely you can also get it in the mid back or the thoracic spine. So let's go over some of the causes of facet joint syndrome. So most commonly, it's due to age-related de degeneration or wear and tear of the spine. I sort of like to think of it as osteoarthritis of the spine. Um, in the cervical spine, you can also often see it um, in patients that have had a recent trauma, such as a car accident, um, that results in a whiplash injury. And the high forces that are involved in such an uh, accident can put more stress on the facet joint, specifically in the cervical or neck region. I also like to think of both modifiable and non-modifiable risk factors for facet joint syndrome. Modifiable meaning things that you can change or you have some control over. Some of the modifiable risk factors for facet syndrome are um, your smoking history, uh, your weight, so if you're overweight or obese, that does put more stress on the joints in your spine, but also other joints in your body. Um, the kind of work lifestyle that you have. So there are certain jobs with heavy manual labor that are more prone to causing facet joint syndrome and also certain activities and hobbies even. So certain sports such as golf um, tends to put more stress in the facet joint. I often see a lot of golfers um, that have been playing for a majority of their life that come in with uh, facet joint pain. And a lot of that has to do with the uh, twisting motion that's involved with proper swing mechanics for that sport. So next we'll go over some of the symptoms of uh, facet joint syndrome. So most commonly these patients present with a dull aching pain in their neck or low back region, but you can have also various referral patterns for facet joint syndrome as well. So talking about the neck region, you can get radiation or referral patterns into the shoulder region, the shoulder blade or scapular region, and even in some cases for higher cervical set, facet pain, you can get radiation into the back of the head or the occipital region or also behind the ear. So it can almost mimic a posterior headache. Going down to the lumbar or low back region, you can have referral or radiation to the, the buttock region, the hips, the groins, and even into the thighs. Most commonly, you don't get pain going down past the knees. So that's actually a question that I ask my patients quite frequently is whether or not they have pain going past their knee. And if the answer is yes, then it often clues me into that there might be something else um, that might be going on. Oftentimes these patients say their pain is aggravated by um, standing, uh, walking, or even prolonged sitting. Um, it's sometimes something where they say they have a lot of stiffness in the morning when they first wake up and then as the day goes on, uh, their pain improves somewhat. So in a majority of cases, I like to take more of a stepwise approach, though there are exceptions to that rule. So beginning with more conservative treatments, we would try things such as physical therapy, um, massage therapy, acupuncture, and in some cases, even chiropractic care. That's kind of category one, which I think of that non-medication, non-injection type or non-procedural approach. 
Category two is the more medication type approach. And there's different classes of medications. There's anti-inflammatory, such as ibuprofen or Aleve. Um, you can also include Tylenol in that. Um, there are other medications such as muscle relaxers. Um, sometimes oral steroids can help. Um, and then I often also recommend trying some over-the-counter treatments such as topical creams or lidocaine patches. Um, a lot of the times, patients don't just have one source of their low back pain. They can have some kind of myofascial or musculoskeletal pain contributing as well. And sometimes attacking their pain from multiple different angles is what's going to give the patient the best result. Now, if they've tried some of those more conservative treatments and they're still having a lot of pain, um, they're still limited in their quality of life or they're not able to do the activities and hobbies that they enjoy doing, then we do consider moving on to the next step, which would be considering more interventional procedural options. options. So in terms of injections that we can do for facet joint syndrome, in some cases you can do a steroid injection to the joint. It's usually something that I consider for patients that might be younger or a patient that I might think might not be a great candidate for some reason for an ablation procedure. Uh, but most commonly, we do a procedure called a radiofrequency ablation for facet joint syndrome. And what a radiofrequency ablation procedure is, is ablation is a fancy medical term for burning. So like we mentioned, there are these small nerves that lie in the grooves in the bone here. And those small nerves are responsible for uh, transmitting the pain signal from the joint up to the brain. So what we do is under x-ray or fluoroscopic guidance, we uh, bring a needle down to where that nerve is, and we inject a little numbing medicine around the nerve to block it. And if you get a good result or a positive block, then the next step is the ablation procedure where we burn those nerves. Now, it's not a permanent burn. The nerves do grow back over time, but on average, the literature shows that the relief you can expect lasts anywhere from 9 to 12 months, but I've certainly had patients that um, have pain relief for up to two years. And that's the, the most common procedural um, option that we have for facet joint pain. It's important to know that facet joint syndrome is just one of the many causes of low back pain. So if you do deal with chronic neck or low back pain, it's very important that you go see your spine or back specialist uh, to get a thorough evaluation to see um, if facet joint syndrome might be the cause of your pain and whether you'd be a candidate for any of the treatments that we discussed today.